Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here and uh, present some of my work. Actually, it's a great opportunity for me to learn from a somewhat different community, but I agree with you that there are commonalities. So yeah, um, as uh, he said, I actually, he didn't say, I grew up in Los Angeles. I'm American, even though I have a, a German name. And I did all my degrees at Stanford University, actually in mechanical engineering, but very interdisciplinary, taking a lot of computer science classes and mechatronic sensors have always fascinated me. My PhD advisor was Gunther Niemeyer. I was his first student, his first PhD student. He's really like a controls and uh, real-time systems for teleoperation. He was one of the first engineers at uh, Intuitive Surgical, which makes the Da Vinci robot. And I, yeah, then he came to academia. And then I moved quickly to Johns Hopkins and worked with Alison Okamura, had a great experience there, and then started started my faculty career at the University of Pennsylvania. I was there for about nine and a half years. Actually, I think this is where I first met Davide uh, when he was there as well in, the, in another part of the grass lab. And I was there for 10 years. And then in uh, 2017, I got the chance to move even farther east uh, to the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems, where I am now here today. Uh, we're a relatively new institute uh, that was only founded about 10 years ago. And we're in Southern Germany and we have two sites in Stuttgart and Tübingen. And it's very interdisciplinary. We're not a university, we don't award degrees, but we're a research institute. And it's been a really uh, fun new step in my career. Uh, we work on intelligent systems, interacting with complex environments, both the scientific understanding, the fundamentals, and then using that to design future systems. Like I said, we have sites in Tübingen, which is more computationally focused, and Stuttgart, which is more physically focused, but there's a lot of overlap between the two. And we cover many fields um, ranging from learning and inference, vision, control, robotics, haptics, um, algorithms, physical implementations. So you may know some of the, my wonderful colleagues. It's really, they are the reason why I came here. Um, along the top, you see the five directors, uh, Michael Black and Bernhard Cholkov. Our newest directors, Christoph Keplinger and Metin City came before I did. Uh, these are like full professors who will be here for a long time. And then we have wonderful group leaders um, who run a group here for a while and then go out and become a professor for themselves. We're part of a larger Cyber, now, Cyber Valley initiative uh, where we run a PhD program with our two joint universities. And it's really a great place to work. Uh, and for me, especially to think about some of these hard problems in how do we create robots that can interact with their environment? And I have people uh, who are experts in machine learning. So I collaborate, say, with Georg Marcius, and we're working on tactile sensors together. I'm collaborating with Michael Black, who's more of a computer vision person. And so anyway, I'll show you some of our work uh, from my team today. But um, And I wanted to show uh, my team members uh, briefly. They're the ones who do the work, PhD students and postdocs, some recently um, uh, postdocs who recently left and are now faculty themselves and I'm still working on I'm working with and some others. Um, but actually today I'm going to tell a longer ago story, not just focusing on, I want it to be a little more reflective. So not only focusing on things we're working on now, I wanted to go back to like, what are some motivations? Like what are we working on and why and what it might, why it might matter. Um, and I chose this picture. Um, you may or may not recognize them. On the left is Carrie Walsh um, and on the right, April uh, Ross. Um, Carrie was an Olympic, is an Olympic beach volleyball player. Um, and this is them playing in the 2016 Olympics and very intense moment in a match. And you can see Carrie going to her partner. It's just two on two beach volleyball and Carrie's putting her hands out like to April, like come give me a high five. And I chose this because we're gonna be talking about physical human robot interaction. Uh, but why I chose this just as a side small story. Actually, when I was a student at Stanford, I had the privilege to play on the Stanford volleyball team. And this is me sitting next to Carrie Walsh. And I look up to her hugely. She was a wonderful teammate. I learned a lot by being an athlete um, and playing on a team and competing together. And I, I bring that perspective into how I run my research group somewhat as well. I think there are perspectives from sports uh, and I see that in this, uh, in the community that's represented here. Um, but coming back to this picture, uh, Carrie is special, a friend of mine, um, but why did I choose this? So this physical human human interaction, as little as we get to experience it during COVID, physically interacting with other people, whether it's in the middle of a volleyball game or when you wake up in the morning or see a friend in the hallway um, or at a conference when they take place in person, these interactions between people are highly dynamic. Uh, they're multi-sensory. Clearly they involve vision uh, and we're very, very attuned to seeing other people looking at their gestures, their facial expressions. It involves sound, it involves touch, which is the main thing I'll be talking about today. 
And it's very socially powerful. These interactions have a tangible, often positive, sometimes negative impacts on us as humans. And so to me, that makes it a very interesting topic to can we create interactions like this with robots? Because we envision a future where robots can help us as humans, where we want them to come into our environments and clean up our kitchen uh, or put away objects or be delivering items. And not only that they need to physically do those tasks, and I work on things like that as well, and I'm fascinated by it, but they're gonna be around people and they're gonna need to interact with people and be, function in that even more complex dynamic system. Um, and so I chose the picture of a PR2 because it's also special to me. When I was an assistant professor at Penn, I helped write a proposal to get a PR2 at, in the beta program from Willow Garage. And this is actually our PR2, Graspy from back then. Uh, and I hadn't actually, when I started as a professor, I hadn't worked on any autonomous robots. I'd only worked on haptic interfaces, teleoperation, where a human remotely controls a robot. There are actually a lot of insights from those areas, because I was always thinking about the tactile signals that, or the haptic cues that we wanted to render. And these are topics my group still works on. What do I want a person to feel if they're touching a surface? Or uh, what cues should I be measuring from a da Vinci robot or a construction robot if I want an operator to be able to control it and suture or put together parts of a building. Those are also the same kinds of signals that we want a robot to, an autonomous robot to be able, should, we should, should pay attention to and should have access to. And so in, in my opinion, this robot was a wonderful step forward. It's a uh, very lightweight, arms back drivable, capable, can drive around, it has sensors. They look outdated uh, uh, to us now, but it was really very capable. And I believe that how can we help current robots? A, a big gap, I think, uh, for how current robots can contribute and, and do useful tasks in the world is that they need tactile sensing. They need to be able to feel things that they're touching, whether it's a human they're bumping up against into in the hallway, hopefully it doesn't happen, but it might happen, or a high five um, or, or other physical interactions. Robots need to be able to feel their world. Vision works at a distance, but at some point there are some kinds of things, especially contact that are hard to perceive visually. Um, these tactile sensing, they should be, have broad spatial sensitivity. So this PR2 is totally numb all over it. There's no tactile sensing. It has tactile sensors, I'll show a little bit more, right only at its bare little fingertips. And then also uh, some accelerometers in the wrist, which are super, super helpful. Uh, you need real-time processing. Data is streaming into the robot. It has to be able to have access to that data with as little latency as possible. Uh, we need to especially pay attention to transients. Uh, events indicate changes in state. And I think as a roboticist, we might often like want a force sensor and then look at the force vector. But really where I want to spend a lot of my attention is changes, um, not just the quasi-static loads uh, that are happening, but uh, changes, transients, events are really important. Um, and then the robot has to be able to react quickly to that information and it's never gonna have perfect information. So um, I, maybe these are common themes in a lot of the kinds of systems, whether it's flying vehicles or driving vehicles or a robot that's interacting around people. Um, I come from the field of haptics, mainly within the larger field of robotics. And I, I mentioned something on the last slide but didn't highlight it. The broader field of haptics is concerned with two main different data streams, uh, which work together, they're complementary. But when I say something is tactile, or sometimes people use the word cutaneous, they're thinking more about skin. So actually covering uh, the, the robot or the agent or the person, the animal with sensors or a sensing system that's sensitive to contact or physical interaction and temperatures. So, yeah, where is something touching the robot? Is it pressing? Is it shearing laterally? The many, very, very few tactile sensors can feel that. Are things slipping against the robot? Are the things you're touching vibrating or something I'm holding vibrating? Or are things changing in temperature? And temperature is very important for materials. If you're warm and you touch something and it takes uh, heat from you, you can tell it's like a piece of metal. Um, and then where roboticists have actually focused a lot more of our attention over the years is more on the kinesthetic side of robot haptic capabilities, which is deeper in your body. So it's about the position and orientation. So it would be your pose and also maybe the force and torque that you're exerting, your actuator. This is important. Robots almost always have these sensors and some awareness of this, but what they're really often missing and where I would like to see more investment is in tactile capabilities, perception, adding more data streams. And you can probably already tell um, 
some things I'm talking about here might have commonalities with vision. You might be tempted to think like, oh, my skin is kind of like my retina because it's this distributed pressure, but actually your skin is much very different in different locations, like your fingertips, um, the non-hairy skin on your hands versus the hairy skin. Um, and then it also, you could think about, it's a little bit also like your ears because it has these vibrations. And it's actually many channels all together that we lump together into touch. Um, and I think that's part of what makes it so interesting. And it's not nearly as well understood yet as audio or vision. Uh, and so I picked a few key projects that I will show you, things my team has worked on, kind of chronologically arranged, um, to show you some of the things that I think are interesting um, or have thought were interesting and that might resonate with you as well. So first, my very first PhD student, Joe Romano, uh, worked as an intern at Willow Garage, the company that makes this PR2, made this PR2 robot. He now is director of engineering at Berkshire Gray, which is a Boston uh, robotics company. But he interned there, even knowing we were going to get a PR2, PR2, and we were working on picking up objects, like random objects, objects where you didn't know what it was. Could we, we, he went and collected this huge, at the time it seemed huge, it's not huge anymore, but big set of objects with many different properties. And could we have the robot pick these things up? And how could we? And we, uh, this beautiful review paper by Roland Johansson and Randall Flanagan had just been published in Nature Reviews Neuroscience uh, that really laid out in beautiful detail how when humans pick things up and set things down, the sensations in your fingertips play a key role, and especially in an event-based way that we operate. When you try to pick up a, a glass of water, an object, and pick it up and maybe move it around and set it back down, you're not dead reckoning uh, from your vision. You use that as a rough guide, but then you switch into a mode where you're waiting for a tactile event, like to switch from getting my hand into establishing contact, uh, this is the reach and knowing exactly when contact started. And then you have to switch from a position control to force control and bringing up your grip so that now you can lift the object. You have enough friction to hold it, move it around. You might feel it slip in your fingers while you're holding it and then want to go set it down. You don't like put the glass exactly where you think it will be. You move down until you feel uh, that contact. And they do a beautiful job of explaining four different kinds of mechanoreceptors. FA means fast adapting, attuned to events, changes. SA, slowly adapting, like, um, like steady state levels. And you see a lot of these events happen in these fast adapting channels. That, and this is like what's known for science, scientifically about this human sense of touch. And so we tried to replicate that with our PR, with the PR2, which had very, very primitive, very primitive sensors, uh, had these 15 plus a few more tactile pressure sensors sampled at 24 Hertz. And they had a lot of hysteresis. They weren't linear, but at least there was something. And an accelerometer, a vibration sensor rigidly mounted to the wrist. And we basically looked at how far could we get? How much could we replicate this beautiful, uh, beautiful choreography that humans use when they pick up objects and set them back down using these quite primitive tactile sensors? And we did it by mimicking these tactile signals. And I'll just walk you through this as a single trial, starting from the left, uh, the robot's closing its fingers. And we can see both from the transient on the gripper disturbance and on the acceleration that it makes contact and then it moves it around. We detect a slip based on feeling a change and can grab a little harder and then move the object around in the air. I'll show you videos in a moment. And then here, when we're setting the object back down, very, very clearly see well, here, right here, this is the set down, the big spike, the big impact when the robot sets it down and it knows now I should let go and uh, then it won't smash the wine glass into the table. So here's just a few videos, uh, old videos, raw egg, uh, nectarine, showing the robot could feel. Um, and I'll let those play. They take a little while, they're real time. And the robot's trying to feel. We had such bad sensing, but this was the best we could do. We could figure out where the object was and then squeeze it and do kind of primitive force control. Down at the lower left, you see Joe pouring in more marbles and the robot's like reacting and squeezing harder. And this actually isn't so relevant, right? This isn't a human robot interaction, but it was something we did and I, I enjoyed it. But on the side, well, this last video is what I wanted to show you. Joe couldn't help but notice that the robot also became much more socially intelligent when it had these like event-based uh, tactile uh, signals. So here he's just showing this like a first video he sent me of the, the PR2 holding a tennis ball. And then instead of um, dropping it when he's shaking it around, he could like 
get it to really know when he was touching it and handing it over. And so we got excited and interested in human robot interaction, handing objects, taking objects, and physically interacting with people using these same very rudimentary but processed and clever way tactile signals. And so this is the demo that I think Joe was actually even more proud of over his summer. It was called PR2 Props. And he programmed the PR2 to make high fives and then also uh, fist bumps. He explained high fives were for old people like me and fist bumps and fist bump explodes were much cooler. And these are reacting. So the robot is just going through a known pre-programmed trajectory, um, but it's using these tactile transients. It's feeling both for contact or for acceleration transients. And it's really fun. We ran this demo hundreds of times. Maybe it's not as good as Carrie Walsh and April Walsh, uh, but it's actually really fun. So this is in just our random lab. This is an old video I was able to find. We would bring kids in, teenagers, teachers, and, and adults, uh, <laughs> robotics professors, and let them play with the PR2. And it was more engaging than we ever imagined. Um, and then I had, so that was Joe, my first PhD student. And then my one, two, three, four, fifth PhD student, Naomi Fitter, who's now an assistant professor at Oregon State, came to my lab like right after Joe had graduated or around the time. And she saw us running this demo and thought that was fascinating. And she was always really interested in the interaction. I'll just start playing this video, which is a video Naomi made about hand clapping and starting to look at, okay, how people interact with hand clapping. And she also videoed some, some fails to show it's not always trivial. Um, and she got excited about having robots and enabling robots to do these physical interactions um, between people. And we moved from using the PR2 to using Baxter. Uh, it's even, I think, safer. It's more expressive with it with a face. And we had access to a platform, uh, this platform. She recorded people. We brought people into our lab, having them hand clapping. And then she, over the course of several years, programmed Baxter to successively play different hand clapping games and, uh, better and better and studying what mattered and how to make these interactions really enjoyable. That's Naomi demonstrating like really nice rhythmic hand clapping. Uh, we have a paper called like synchronicity trumps mischief. And like we showed like the facial responses were important and varied all these different parameters. And actually it's quite exhausting to hand clap with a robot. And that gave us for the last part of Naomi's thesis, uh, we realized it was making exercise fun. And exercise is something all of us should probably do more of. And so for the last part of Naomi's thesis, we made a bunch of exercise games um, targeted more at older adults, but really anyone who has more of a sedentary lifestyle and trying to get you up and out and playing with a robot uh, physically. And this has been done somewhat. And we thought a key ingredient we particularly wanted to look at was physical contact. And that means sensing and perceiving and reacting to those contacts with the people. And this was published in JNER, Journal of Neuroengineering and Re Rehab, only last year. Um, oh, and I forgot to mention, this is collaborative work with Michelle Johnson, who's a wonderful professor at Penn in the Medical School in Physical Medicine and Rehab, and Mayumi Mohan was a master's student at the time, now my PhD student. Um, and we made eight exercise games, and the ones in pink at the top, these six all involve physical interaction between the user and the robot. And I'll just show you the videos. They were all designed um, with game designers uh, and rehab therapists. And this one, the robot is sleeping and you have to wake it up. Oh, can you hear the sound? You probably can't. I probably forgot to share my sound. Let me click share sound. Actually, we, we do hear it. Can, can you do, it, but I think it. you're hearing it not firsthand. You're hearing the non cancel. So I, I added the sound. So you probably heard it enough. So anyway, this game, you had to wake up the robot and it really motivated you to hit and hit and hit and hit. And the robot is actually counting the number of hits and reacting a little bit differently and giving you a score at the end of how well you did. And then another one, this is actually everyone's favorite game. The robot plays like some motivational music and you have to hit its hand in turn and again it like looks at how hard you're hitting it and if you, how long of a time delay passes to like get an estimate of your health or your in enthusiasm and then we also program some tradition more traditional uh human robot interaction games often if uh, people have done robot yoga where you imitate the robot's pose it's actually quite peaceful it's it's fun but you don't ever touch it and actually the robot has no idea if you're doing the pose or not we had absolutely no vision nothing and it was still pretty uh pretty fun and pretty motivating and i will this isn't an hri talk but we asked people a lot of questions we had 40 people younger and older adults 40 like a bunch of questions before and after and if there's a star it means it went up significantly after playing with a robot for about an hour and a half and all these different games and the summary was like 
people really trusted and had more confidence in this robot after they had interacted with it compared to the before. And there weren't differences between uh, younger and older adults. And, and lastly, only the games that had these physical interactions were, ended up getting the highest ratings for things like pleasantness and enjoyment and engagement and cognitive challenge, energy level and competitiveness. And I was very proud of this work. It's fascinating, but there also, it showed us huge shortcomings in what we were able to do. Uh, Baxter had absolutely no idea what the robot was doing, what the actions were, and, uh, and that definitely detracted from the interaction. And it also made the analysis of the study really cumbersome because we had to hand code everything that happened in the study, including anything you might wanna know. And that was painful. So that inspired a project that may be more interesting to you that was actually just presented on Tuesday here at ICRA uh, by my PhD student, Mayumi Mohan. And this is work that was joint with Kara Nunez, who was a visiting uh, PhD student from Stanford, visiting in our lab, funded by a DAAD fellowship last year. And here we are trying to move towards what I call unsupervised HRI. And this is not unsupervised like machine learning, but unsupervised like we don't need an experimenter narrating and answering questions. We want to just throw people in a room with a robot and have them have an natural-ish interaction. And for that, of course, the robot, we're still using Baxter, needs to be able to know what's going on. So we purchased um, Capture Live, which comes out of the lab of Kristen Tailbald. It was Nils Hasler's PhD. It's fantastic. We have 10 cameras around the room, fast frame rate, rather low resolution, and it can reconstruct, as you can see in the upper right, how the person is moving, that not just where they are, but also their full pose. And we get this data very, very fast. And that's transformational for us is like doing HRI. Here are, we did only very simple things. This is the participant at a break and you can see the robot looks at him and it's giving him the next cue. I'm not going to go into the details, but we had some, I'll just show one more video. We had a uh, cues where the robot is pointing around the room and we believe people would probably be drawn to that and come over there. Uh, and then the robot also would make arm poses and it, we hypothesized people would mimic the robot. We gave them almost no instructions, just like don't touch the dangerous parts of the robot. You can walk around and, and do whatever you want. Uh, and then also these hand clapping um, poses really, we were able to show people could, it did tend to induce people to come up to the robot and touch the robot. We had seven participants. My, uh, in this, this is just a first study. We have other conditions where the robot is actually reacting to what you're doing. Um, but we were able to make heat maps of like where the people went in the room, where their arms were held relative to their body. And so we could, for example, here, we could see people did mimic the arm poses of the robot. We could see it in the video, but now we have it quantitatively in data. And this is a step in the direction that I'm really excited about enabling more unsupervised human robot interaction for enabling say therapy robots or robot coaches or interactions in the wild. Um, of course, this has many, many shortcomings. We wanna go beyond where's just the person in the room, what pose are they having, how much effort, how much exercise are they really getting? How hard are they hitting the robot uh, if they do? What's their heart rate? Where are they looking? Are they attending to the robot? How do they feel? Is their facial expression show engagement or disappointment or confusion? Our robot doesn't talk. It should be able to talk. There's many avenues that I think will contribute to making richer interactions. Um, and now I wanna go into the last part of my talk. Um, so that was like moving around the room, hitting hands, clapping. We did have a couple subjects hug the robot. Um, which we were surprised about, um, but hugging. This is again, Carrie in April. This is um, again in the same match where they lost to Brazil. And it was the first time Carrie was in the Olympics and didn't win a gold medal. They only got a bronze medal, uh, which is still of course, absolutely amazing. And they're consoling each other through a hug. And again, this is something we haven't been able to do as much as we hopefully, I think many people enjoy hugs um, and physical contact with our loved ones, with our friends, with our family members, with our pets. Um, and scientists know, we know that hugging confers tremendous benefits. So if you've just lost, suffered a horrible loss on television, hugging your partner uh, provides you social support. It actually increases your immune system, improves your oxytocin, reduces your stress, lowers your blood pressure. And when we go through periods of time when, with no physical contact, we actually tend to have social and health problems like depression and lower pain thresholds, lower self-esteem. And if this happens early in life, even it can be harder for us to form long-term relationships. Um, and roboticists have been interested in this question for a long time. Can we create robots that people can interact with to get some of this social touch? Um, 
there have been several big robots that like look like animals and you crawl to meet them. They don't tend to move very much. It's kind of like a big teddy bear that you can hug. There've also been really small ones uh, that you hug, but they don't really move back to you. And then in the middle, we really have been interested in sort of more human size hugging robots. Our first huggy ro hugging robot was Alexis Block's master's thesis. Um, and I won't go into that, it's just a PR2 dressed up in heated and soft outfits um, and with one tactile sensor. But I actually want to show you our newer work, which was published at HRI, the Human Robot Interaction Conference this year. This is Alexis uh, showing Hagibot 2, um, which I think goes in the direction of where we're really excited about. This is cooperative work uh, with Otmar Hilligus and Roger Gassert and other people have participated. Um, so the tactile sensing we made a pneumatically inflated torso because we, we so we built the whole robot from parts um but it has an inflated torso like a beach toy inside there's a pressure sensor and a microphone and that's actually what we're using to know when people are embracing it in a moment i'll show you intra hug action it's heated it's soft and it reacts to you and it's actually quite enjoyable to hug um people really enjoyed it. It had some, some primitive visual perception as well. But the part that I wanted to show you, oh yeah, here's some sensor, sample sensor data with the microphone and the pressure sensor look, at, look like during use. And then, but we wanted it to be even more interactive. So you're in the arms of the robot, people would sometimes pat or squeeze the robot. And we wanted to enable like a dynamic interaction between the robot and the person, the user while they're in the embrace. And so we had noticed either people just hold still or they might squeeze or rub or pat the robots back. So we collected a data set where we had people come into the lab, hug the robot and then demonstrate. So we got labeled demonstrations of all these different, um, these four actions. Um, and you can see pressure and microphone. These are just two different people. People move in rad quite wildly different ways. And we train simple machine learning that can run in real time and enable the robot to understand what's happening pretty well uh, while you're hugging it. So here's a subject in our last uh, study. This is, this is actually under review. We're waiting for the reviews. So he goes in for the embrace and he's holding it. And now the robot's doing a little bit of baseline calibration. And then this is at half speed because it's really hard. The robot knows he's just holding him and then doesn't do anything. And then he pats the robot and the robot feels the pat and then responds. And then um, the robot feels a squeeze and the robot response with a squeeze. Um, so there's this dynamic interaction. He pats it again, the robot feels a squeeze, and the robot squeezes. And then he actually wanted to keep patting the robot, but he accidentally let go, which falsely triggered our end the hug. Um, but it's still just a quick interaction that you can get a sense of this um, uh, dynamic interchange. On the perception side, the robot's trying to figure out what is happening, and then also the action deciding what to do in response. And people really enjoyed hugging this robot, they especially love being squeezed by the robot. And they also especially love it when the robot proactively squeezes them. Like it makes them feel the robot really cares for them. Um, anyway, that was the last project I wanted to tell you. I want to summarize just a few overarching ideas that might have popped out uh, or I hope uh, have become apparent. You probably can tell, I think the sense of touch is very important and it's often neglected in robotics. Um, Touch itself is multimodal. It has all these different modalities. We don't understand it nearly as well as we understand vision and audio. Um, if we're going to, if we're going to have robots that can function well in the real world, I believe they need tactile sensors to supplement other and complement other sensory modalities. They need broad spatial sensitivity. Sometimes it's a, an accelerometer that feels vibration through the entire robot, or other times it's actually just the inflated torso, or literally we are also working on robot skin. And they need high temporal bandwidth. That means not just fast sampling rate, but also fast dynamic response so that the robot can attend to changes. Um, we need this perceptual algorithms have to be able to work in real time so we don't have long latencies. And the robot does need to act on that um, information. And something that came up in the last project um, was if the robot, like the consequences, in this case, the social consequences of the robot making the wrong inference or doing the wrong thing, they're not all equally weighted. So it can perceive something and it'll never perceive perfectly. Um, but if it turns out people are very sensitive, they really don't like it if they pat the robot and the robot doesn't do anything in reverse. They feel 
uh, socially harmed. And so we ended up tuning the detector to have a more false positives because false positives were like the robot is being proactive and people love that. They love it when the robot expresses admiration and pats them on the back or squeezes them and they really don't like it. So the social or also physical consequences of different kinds of errors need to be considered and I think make it really interesting. So with that, I will close and that's all I wanted to talk about um, today. And I think we'll have a panel in a bit with questions, so I'll just end there. <laughs>